Luke chapter 24. How long has it been since we last finished the book of Luke? 14 years, four months, and 28 days ago, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, through the Bible teachings, uh, how many have we had? Uh, have you ever wondered how many teachings? Now, I'm not talking about how many services. That'd be a whole nother number, but... Um, how many sermons have I prepared or teachings uh, you know, that I've given on, on this time through? The, the answer is 1,333 teachings uh, to get through the Bible. Uh, that's the 658 weekend services uh, and 675 Wednesday night Bible studies, uh, as it turns out. So it's kind of interesting. That's, that's kind of just some statistics for us. Um, and it's our second time through, which is kind of fun. So... Uh, uh, pretty cool. Uh, now, I, I, is Kit Gaucher? There's Kit right there. And, and is Tracy somewhere near? I, where's Tracy? Oh, and there's Tracy. Okay, I just wanted to point these two ladies out because I think they might be the only people in the room that I know of that were here at the very first teaching Athey Creek ever did. Um, yeah, um, that's pretty, that's, that's great. Uh, Tracy and Kit. Um, the only reason I know that's probably is because I think you guys are the only ones there. Uh, <laughs> we were up in the little pool house up on, uh, what was that, Salamo Drive, that little pool house up in um, Cascade Summit area there. There's a little pool there. And the pool house, that, Tracy was able to open that up for us. And we started our first Bible studies up there. And Kit and Tracy were there. A couple other people. Uh, is Brian Christ here? Brian, are you in the room? He's, he might be up at the farm church, maybe. Brian, you're here? Brian was also there. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it was actually a guy there too. <laughs> Brian holding down the fort. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, th I think, is there anybody else that was in the pool house that I'm forgetting? Nope, I think that was it. Because I remember it was like three people. Uh, that was, but man, it's great to have you all here and it's fun to finish up Luke. Let's get to it. Um, we, uh, on uh, Sunday, went over that section um, uh, about the... Um, the, the, you know, the Emmaus Road. So we've covered some of this a little bit on, on uh, Sunday and, went, and Saturday. But um, it's kind of, fun, kind of fun being able to uh, finish up the, the story here. Um, and it's the most powerful part of the story. We have the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every Christian, in my opinion, should make themselves be an expert on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason why is because the truth of Christianity, every, everything that's true hinges on whether Jesus rose from the grave or did he not rise up from the dead. Um, Jesus would say, you know, uh, you want a sign? Uh, I'll give you a sign. If you destroy this body in three days, I will raise it up from the de dead. So every Christian should be able to defend, you know, the resurrection and, and maybe even explain it and, and, and be good at that. So if you're interested, by the way, um, because, you know, Resurrection Sunday, we tend to talk about the the resurrection of Jesus over and over again, uh, year after year. The, um, if you want to do, we've done a whole bunch of teaching on the resurrection and, um, you know, ver the verification of Jesus, who he claimed to be. Um, you know, it's Romans chapter one, verses three and four. Paul the apostle kind of puts it interestingly. Um, it says there in Romans one, three and four, he says um, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now that's a mouthful there, isn't it? But how did Jesus confirm his claims to be the Messiah? It was by the resurrection of the dead that confirms that. Um, you know, um, that's John chapter two, by the way, verses 18 and 19, when the Jews said, show us a sign, you know, that, you know, what you're doing is, is legit, you know, and, and Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise up his body being the temple in that case. Um, now, for some people say, I don't know, you know, the whole story of the Bible and Jesus was a good teacher and a good prophet, but the whole resurrection thing, I don't know, seems a little hard to believe. And sadly, there are those who will try to discount the resurrection and they'll say, oh, Jesus merely, you know, swooned. That was one the professor that told me that in college, you know, that Jesus, the Christians believe Jesus rose from the grave, but he merely swooned, which the word swooning, I didn't even know what that meant. Swoon, like it sounds weird. What is swooning? Um, uh, it's, it's the most ridiculous uh, argument, if you ask me. It, it means that Jesus, you know, um, you know uh, was not really completely dead, 
when they put him in the tomb. They wrapped him up, thought he was dead. You know, it's like one of these, you know, YouTube stories where you hear of a guy getting put in a casket and then all of a sudden, coo, 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 let me out. And you realize he was actually not completely dead. And so, uh, uh, you know, they'd pop him out and stuff. That has happened in times past. Um, and so some people try to say, that's what happened. They thought he was dead, but he wasn't really dead. Um, but what a ridiculous, uh, you know, belief. Um, you know, if you, if you think that the resurrection uh, from the dead is a hard thing to believe. Swooning's even harder if you ask me. Because Jesus was beaten with a whip of a flagellum, uh, which many people would die just from that. He was beaten by the Roman soldiers, nails in hands and feet, hung on a cross. The Romans were experts on death. They knew what dead looked like and they were good at that. That was their expertise. Um, then a spear in the side, just to make sure he was dead and out came a flow of blood and water, which um, those that are forensic medicine people, you know, doctors that sort of, uh, you know, uh, assess how a person died, they believe literally that kind of gives us ed uh, education about Jesus, how he died. Literally have a burst heart where there was a mixture of blood and water coming out of his side with this evidence of that. Um, and, and then, you know, he's dead, he's laid in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the grave. So, so to believe in the swoon theory, you have to believe he went through all that, and the moist, cool air of the tomb just made him feel so much better. Uh, and he got up and thought, oh man, I'm awesome. And then he, and then he pushes a two-ton stone out of the, out of the opening of the tomb uh, and then fights through the Roman soldiers on his way out, uh, feeling that peppy. Uh, and um, like, like if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you should probably take some time and really study that. I love, you know, some of the secularists who made it their job to say, I'm gonna disprove Christianity. And it was always this point of the resurrection that would actually not disprove Christianity, but actually only reinforce it. Guys like Lee Strobel, who write, wrote The Case for Christ, and what a great story of a guy who made it his life goal to disprove Christianity only to be convinced. And the resurrection was sort of the, the key part. Um, that's why we need to know the resurrection. Acts chapter 17 uh, also reminds us there. It says that uh, at times of this, um, of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that in that he hath raised him from the dead. Um, this is a sobering uh, word. This whole raising Jesus from the dead um, is really quite shocking. Uh, you know, that, that, that's going to be the very thing that will judge the world, uh, it says in this section of Scripture. When everything's done and you stand before God in heaven, the biggest point you'll have against you if you uh, did not accept Christ is not believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ didn't raise up from the dead, then Christianity would not be true and we should pack up our Bibles and just go home and watch TV instead of spend time at a Wednesday night Bible study. But because he has risen from the grave, uh, he's alive and well, and he's moving in his church. And I think we're seeing that here at Aether Greek. We see the, the risen savior moving in our lives, changing our lives, saving us from our sins. What a glorious thing Jesus has done for us. So here in Luke 24, we have this story. It's a powerful and important one. Verse one. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Uh, okay, so uh, interesting, who, who are these people? Well, we're gonna find out these are the women that we left off with uh, earlier. Um, we're gonna see that uh, these women that come to the tomb, they were the last ones to leave the cross. Where was that? Verse 49 of the previous chapter. And they're the first ones to come to the tomb. Um, they couldn't do the spices and stuff like that um, because uh, th there was a Sabbath and they, they had to wait for a certain time. Um, which is interesting. But notice here, um, it's the first day of the week and very early in the morning. Um, question, what was the first day of the week? Sunday. Sunday, right. Everybody thinks it's Monday. Oh, it's Monday. No, it's Sunday. Because the Sabbath was Saturday, and so uh, Jesus rose on Sunday. Um, have you ever been told by someone that if you meet on Sunday, if you come to our Sunday services, have you ever been told by someone that you've taken the mark of the beast because you're meeting on a Sunday? I've been told that before. You, you Athey Creekers are, uh, uh, you know, you're taking the mark of the beast. And I said, well, that's only our Sunday people. It's, it's the Saturday people that they haven't 
No, I don't, I don't say that. Um, there's some extreme, not all of the, uh, some of the Seventh-day Adventists, some, some of them, and some others will believe if you're meeting on a Sunday, you're, you're you know, taking the mark of the beast, then there's a whole, you can find websites and stuff like that that sort of argue that. Um, but uh, let me just remind us that, uh, you know, why did the church start meeting on Sunday? Some people, you know, claim it was the Catholic church that sort of did that stuff. You can make whatever argument you want, but the Bible actually says that the, the church started meeting on the first day of the week. Um, and why did they do that? Um, probably because on the Sabbath day, the, the, the temple or the synagogues that the church would use were busy and used for, you know, the Jewish rabbis to teach and what have you. And so they would meet on the first day of the week using the synagogues and even the temple. We'll see that even tonight, that the, the Christians would use the temple uh, to um, worship Jesus, which is kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, people say, well, you know, the real Sabbath day is Saturday. Read your Bible. And, and it's true that the Jews' Sabbath day is on a Saturday, but, but the early church met on Sunday. And, and why? Um, maybe because logistics, but also most scholars would agree it's because Jesus rose on a Sunday morning. And so the Christian church, get, they just said, hey, let's, let's make the Sabbath or our Sabbath be on a Sunday. It's just that simple. Now, there's some esoteric and more uh, cerebral arguments that you can find and people have about when you should meet on the Sabbath and, and why, and I understand that. And don't write letters. I've got them already uh, 100 times over, all your letters about why we, we shouldn't meet on Sundays and stuff like that. But the key, uh, the key verse maybe for those that are really freaked out about that is just to remember Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Uh, Paul made this argument, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Um, the Old Testament sacrificial system and, and the Sabbath day and all that, it's all beautiful pictures, or as in this case, it says a shadow of something else. What is more important, the actual shadow or the thing that creates the shadow? Um, you know, you got to remember, Jesus is the real deal. The Sabbath is only a shadow, and the Passover is a shadow, and the Old Testament sacrifice system, it's a shadow. Jesus is the real deal. And guess what? The church of Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. So we have Christ. The church has Christ. So um, for people to make a huge deal about the Sabbath day and which day you meet, they're missing the point altogether. Um, you know, and I've always used that goofy story. I'm sure Debbie loves this one. Uh, when I come home from work, if Debbie runs out into the driveway and she says, oh, Brett, you're home from work, and she falls down and starts kissing my shadow um, and uh, 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 kissing our driveway. And I'm like, honey, I'm right here. I, it's me. I'm here. It's, who cares about my shadow? I'd be saying, I want the kiss. Give me the kiss. In the same way, I feel like there's Christians uh, 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 kissing the gravel. Uh, because they're all into the shadow when we, as a Christian Jesus Christ church, we have Christ. He's the head of the church. And that's why Paul makes this declaration. You know, um, don't, don't let anybody judge you on the new moon, feast, festival, Sabbath days, um, which are a shadow of things to come. What's the things to come? But the body is of Christ. In other words, we're the body, he's the head. And so thus we have Christ with us. Remember when, um, you know, Jesus tried to make this argument with the stubborn religious guys, you know, um, when the bridegroom's there, you don't, you don't have to you know, worry about it. I mean, you shouldn't be fasting and mourning if the bridegroom's there. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and Jesus made that argument, I'm here. That's why nobody's fasting, uh, because uh, I'm here, the, the Messiah. All that to say, the important thing is to... Uh, now, by the way, the Sabbath principle is one I think should be remembered, of course. Uh, and I think you can make that Tuesday if that works for you and your job timing and stuff like that. If Tuesday's a day you take and, and use it as a Sabbath day uh, to set aside one day for the Lord in seven, um, that's a great thing. And it's a principle of the, of the word, but don't let any man judge you concerning that. Well, these women that come to the tomb, last ones to leave the cross, first ones to come to the tomb. Again, I, I mentioned this on Sunday, the women played such a key role in the very early church and the spreading of the gospel message that Jesus um, had risen from the grave. What an important message. And the Lord used the women to get that message out. And it says here in verse one, it was very early in the morning. Proverbs eight seventeen says, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall what? Find me. Uh, now, some of you are like, oh, Brett, you just like to get up early. No, I don't. 
Um, I, I've actually had to sort of learn to get up early and I don't always get up early. I, I, I like sleeping in if I can. Um, now, it's funny, I remember, you know, um, uh, my grandpa used to get up really early and, and I thought, wow, he's such a saint, you know, he gets up at 4 a.m. And then I realized old people struggle with sleeping. Um, that's what I learned about my grandpa. And, and uh, when the older you get, sometimes you just kind of wake up early and, and then you can act sanctimonious. Yeah, all these young kids will sleep in until 8 a.m., you know, and you're getting up. Uh, so I, I'm starting to get to be that age where I'm starting to understand. You just kind of wake up and you're deathly tired all day uh, because of that. <clears throat> but, but there is something to be said. If, if you ever um, notice, usually successful people, if you just kind of look at what's going on out there, they tend to get up early. And uh, the old early bird gets the worm, as we mentioned earlier tonight. Uh, you know, those who seek me early shall find me. What does it mean by early? Um, it could mean early in the morning. It also could mean, by the way, early before everything else. Uh, maybe that's what it means. Uh, you know, like when Jesus said, you know, in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Like go early there before you go and seek, uh, you know, wisdom from your doctor, which is great. Seek wisdom from your doctor, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. Uh, early is a good one. It could mean early in the morning. Um, uh, and so if you're not an early riser, uh, you know, that's, there's something that comes from training. You can learn to be an early riser. Um, when I was a little kid, we lived on a, a small farm and had dairy cows. You had to milk them. And they, one thing about dairy cows, they don't stay milked. Uh, you have to get up early uh, before school, uh, before work. Uh, I remember my dad getting up early when we had Rosie, Daisy, and Pansy. They were Jersey cows. Um, Jerseys, by the way, uh, are quite the milk producers. We had one cow, uh, Daisy, she cranked out eight gallons of milk every day. Uh, she cranked it out. Um, you can look that up. Jersey cows are kind of famous for that. And not only that, but mo there's a large portion of it is actually like cream, you know, like it's the thick cream milk. Um, but there was something, you know, I hated about getting up early uh, to work on the little farm and stuff. But, you know, my dad and I still talk about how my mom, she made our little barn really cozy and cute, had little lights and a little heater. And the, where the, you know, it was just, it's hard to explain, but it was, you know, if we ever, our house burned down, we'd probably live in our barn because my mom made it cute and had little curtains. And, but um, you, you would clamp, you know, Rosie and Daisy in the stall, you know, clamp down and, um, and then you would just sit there, you know, five in the morning and uh, you'd milk the cow. And, and we didn't have the fancy machine milk. You know, we were out there with our hands. And uh, just that sound and the cow, you know, chewing a cud and, um, and the heater that was kind of behind us where you kind of stay warm and stuff. There was something sort of therapeutic about that, but it was also a good time to pray and a good time to, you know, think about the day and seek the Lord and, you know, ask him to bless the things that you're concerned about. And, you know, there's something about that when we sort of had to get up early, uh, there's actually a blessing in that. Um, and starting your day with the Lord, I think that's kind of important. Um, but these women come early in the morning, the first moment they possibly could. Um, and by the way, have you ever regretted getting up early to seek the Lord? Like, have you ever got, man, I wish I would have just kept sleeping. Um, uh, you don't ever feel that way. You feel that way right when the snooze button is next to you. You're like, oh, you know, I, I, I just want to sleep. Every time I think of my snooze button, I think of Proverbs 6, verses 9 and 11. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? It says there. When will you arise out of sleep? Yet a little sleep and a little slumber, <laughs> a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one in travail, as one as an armed man. So, you know, you'll, you'll come to poverty if you put the snooze button. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> but anyway, these ladies are bringing the spices which they had prepared. Why are they bringing spices? It was part of the burial process. Uh, it wasn't just like bringing flowers and setting them next to a, a grave. It was actually part of the, uh, the preserved, uh, preserving of it. Now, what's interesting about this, um, uh, Jesus's burial needed to be quick, if you recall, because of the Passover, if, if you remember our previous readings. But uh, Luke 23, 56, if you remember, they returned and prepared spices and ointments and then rested on the Sabbath day, according to the scripture. Uh, that's what they did. So this is their first chance to really do it correctly. And that's why they're showing up early to uh, continue the embalming sort of process and what have you. Um, what was their plan to move the stone uh, to get into the tomb? Does anybody remember? 
Right, they had no plan. <laughs> I, I, again, I love these ladies. They just go, we don't know how we're gonna get the stone out, uh, out of the tomb, but we're gonna just go. Sometimes you have to go, but you don't know how the Lord's gonna work stuff out. Have you ever had your life in that situation where you know the Lord's calling you to do something? You don't really know the how, but you know that the Lord's called you to do it. And, and that's something that the Lord takes care of. And uh, so uh, we'll see that, how the Lord takes care of that here. But there, uh, what was their plan uh, for having the stone move? They had no plan. Um, remember the old Keith Green song? I love it. You know, just keep doing your best, pray that it's blessed, and he'll take care of the rest. Um, I have found that to be true, uh, that the Lord is faithful in all those things. So I, I really love these ladies, their faith to just trust the Lord, to do what was right, um, seeking him early, pretty powerful. Verse two, it goes on. And yeah, we better, we better get on here, verse two. <laughs> and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So the stone problem was taken care of. <laughs> but verse four, and it came to pass, as they were much perplexed there about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Interesting, two men described here in Luke, uh, mysteriously though, having shining garments. Um, uh, other gospels uh, mention that they're angels. They, the other gospels call them angels. So we do know they're angels, but here in Luke, just two men with shining clothing. Um, but it says there in verse five, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of the sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the 11 and to all the rest. Um, this is great. Why do you seek the living, uh, you know, among the dead? Uh, and, and they're kind of like, you know, I wonder if they had puzzled looks on their face. No, he's dead. We saw him. He was dead. But then I love what this angel says. He says, remember these angels. Now, before we talk about what these angels say, um, do you believe in angels? Um, you know, it's interesting. Oftentimes angels do appear uh, as men. The Bible even tells us that. In Hebrews 13, verses one and two, it says, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful, forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Um, so, uh, you know, isn't that interesting? Um, I'm always a little leery when people write a book, I saw an angel or, you know, touched by an angel or whatever their, you know, claim is. Uh, because the Bible says you'll entertain angels, yes, but you'll be unaware of it, uh, which is kind of an interesting deal. So I'm a little skeptical sometimes of the, you know, I saw an angel or whatever. Maybe, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but um, it says here, you'll see them un unaware. So um, isn't that amazing to think about how somebody maybe even sitting next to you tonight is an angel? <laughs> Probably not. Um, yeah, you're like, no, my husband's deep, deep undercover, deep undercover. <laughs> Uh, as an angel. Uh, <laughs> no, um, it's funny how articles have been written, books have been seen about, uh, you know, angels and stuff like that. But the Bible says we'll be aware, unaware. The Bible also, um, you know, the big question, do you have a guardian angel? Um, that, that's kind of an interesting question about that. Um, what, if, if I do, uh, I have a few questions I wanna ask my guardian angel when I get to heaven. Like, where were you, dude? Uh, when I needed you. Uh, like, I don't know, maybe. I don't, but, um, you, know, you know, I'm not sure we have an airtight case against the, the, you know, this idea of a guardian angel. Where does the guardian angel idea come from? It comes from Matthew 18, 10, where, uh, you know, Jesus said, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. So uh, in the context of this whole chapter, by the way, Matthew chapter 18, the little ones could either apply to those who believe in him, God's children, generally, um, which is in verse six of that same chapter, or it could refer to the little children, uh, the little actual children. Maybe children only have a guardian angel that is over in charge of them. Um, but this is kind of the key passage we have. Um, and so uh, the question is, do we have guardian angels? I'm not sure you can say airtight for sure. Um, and if that makes you bummed out, it shouldn't. I'll tell you why. Um, in the end, whether we have a guardian angel or not assigned to protect us, 
Um, do you know that you have even a greater assurance of safety and blessing than a goofy angel? Now, I'm, I gotta be careful. I know angels aren't goofy, but compared to God, they are. And the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the Lord says, I'm working all things together for good in your life. Like we have God who's you know, with us, who will never leave us. So you know, this guardian angel thing, I think maybe people make too much of that perhaps. Um, but just a few things about angels. Angels are created beings. Um, they're definitely not to be worshiped uh, that we read in the Bible. First Corinthians 6, 3 um, uh, tells us something odd. It says, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Um, you know, and Paul's making the argument, man, we need to have good judgment now because there's coming a time where you and I uh, will judge angels. When's that gonna happen? Um, and now, now what's interesting, the Bible seems to uh, indicate, if you read about the angels, um, that they're just sitting there going, looking at humanity going, wow, I can't believe God's working with these people. It's like they're taking their wing and scratching their head just going, what? Why does God love these people? But here's the thing that's gonna, when we see him, we will be what? Like him. We're in our glorified bodies. And when we get to be with the Lord in eternity, we're gonna be enlightened. We're gonna be better than we are now. But so much better, it seems, the Lord's gonna use us sort of to be those who would, in, in a sense, judge the angels. That's what Paul's making the argument. Uh, Satan was once an angel, uh, fallen. Um, did he take a third of the angels with him? Some people believe that. From a kind of a cryptic passage in Revelation chapter 12, verse four, and his tail, the dragon, you know, drew a third part of the stars from heaven and did cast them to the earth. That's what we have. That's why people say a third of the angels fell with Satan because of this verse. Again, I'm not sure that's an airtight case. We do know that Satan uh, was thrown out of heaven and we do know that some of the other angels went with him. Was it a third? Maybe from this verse. Um, interesting, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 declares this, unto whom it was revealed uh, that um, not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Um, what's, what's the, what are the angels interested in? Um, uh, it's, they're interested in how the Lord's using us, especially when it comes to uh, us preaching the gospel and the Lord using us for his purpose. Uh, so why are these angels interested in us being saved? I think maybe they see how dumb we are and they're like, wow, God loves those people. And he's like, he, they're just, they're just uh, it seems like um, they're kind of shocked by the whole thing. But this angel here uh, says to the, the women in verse five, why seek ye the living among the dead? Um, and you really can't have a, a spiritual life, true life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You can't have true life unless you recognize Jesus is in fact the resurrection and the life. Um, when you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, it's this dark, kind of really, really old church, and it's kind of depressing. People are wiping stones with cloths, trying to get DNA in their cloth of Jesus, and uh, it's just weird. It's a traditional site of where they might have believed Jesus was uh, crucified and buried. Um, there's another place that doesn't say for sure that they're the place, but they give some ar arguments of why it's possibly the place. I love this place in Jerusalem. If you ever go to Jerusalem, make sure and stop by Gordon's tomb. It's, it's a place that was found in the 1800s by the British in some archeological digs. And it's where they found a tomb that was just like the description in, in the Bible of Jesus' tomb. It, it fulfills nine, there's nine requirements for this for a tomb to, to fit the description. This tomb having a water cistern next to it, a garden um, and a place where they would have been just outside the city walls at that time with the hill of the skull, a place of crucifixion next to it. Oh, by the way, there's the nose that, see how the nose fell off there of the skull? Um, uh, but this is some video we shot last time we were there. And uh, you know we were worshiping uh, at the end of our trip in Israel. We were able to go to this garden tomb and and see um, you know Gordon's uh, people. They studied the dirt even in the, the, the when they found this tomb, and they found that no body had ever decayed or there's no evidence of any DNA in the dirt of this tomb floor. So it was a very wealthy man's tomb that was never used as a tomb, uh, shockingly. And if you look closely on the outside of this tomb, there's an anchor carved, uh, which was, which was the, by the way, the symbol, that's where the big stone would have rolled in that trough that's in front of this old tomb uh, from the first century era. 
Now the round stone is not there. Uh, where is it? Don't have any idea uh, where the stone is from this tomb, but they don't have it anymore. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that's actually the anchor. You can't see it very well in this picture, but there's anchors carved from, you know, 2,000 years ago, which, which might be a sign of the church as the anchor was the sign of the church more than the cross even. But when you go in this, you see exactly like the Bible describes. There's like a shelf there where they would lay the body. Uh, and uh, it, it was a very typical of a tomb of the first century. Um, and there's some markings on the inside, some frescoes and stuff that had been preserved where um, it might indicate that, uh, that this was in fact a place of Jesus's burial. Again, it's not as important where it happened, it's that it happened. And um, I love it when you see this, you know, uh, on the inside it says, you know, he is risen, he is not here, he is risen. You know, why do you seek the living among the dead like the angel uh, said to the women? Um, so all that to say, uh, this is just kind of a, a beautiful sort of um, uh, place to visit uh, and, and very, very uh, sweet, it's quiet. It's one of the quiet corners of Jerusalem. There's nothing quiet about Jerusalem, uh, but when you get in there, uh, the garden tomb is just really something to see. Um, now, verse eight, there's something I'd like to point out before we move on. And they remembered his words. Um, do you remember how many times uh, Jesus told them, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem, they're gonna you know, crucify me, beat me. I mean, how many times did he say this? And I, I, I was stressing that point over and over again because I wanted us all to see, wow, Jesus really did bring that up a lot. And yet, isn't it something that how, how many of the disciples just didn't remember that he was gonna raise from the dead? Um, I think it was just so extraordinary that they probably thought, well, he's probably talking something figurative. I think they just must have dismissed it somehow. as like, oh yeah, he's gonna raise from the dead. Whatever that means. Like, uh, we'll forget about that because it's just a little loony tune. I wonder how many things we don't listen to when the Lord is whispering in our ear, telling us true things that we don't listen to because we think, oh, that's never gonna happen. Or because our lack of faith, we just kind of dismiss it. But I love how this angel reminds them of Jesus's words. That's always a good thing to do. Remember, he said, uh, they remembered his words. Even verse six, he is not here, but is risen. Remember verse six, he says. Um, what makes a good pastor, counselor, minister, Sunday school teacher, preaching with eloquence? Uh, knowing how to go visit people in hospitals, knowing how to do a good wedding or funeral? Uh, delivering a good eulogy or speech? Is that what makes a good minister? Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. But the Bible talks about what a good minister does. And I think it's kind of interesting. Paul told young Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, it says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So if you wanna be a good minister, servant of the Lord, um, you put people in remembrance, um, which is kind of an important thing. Uh, one of the things, if you've been going through the Bible with us uh, here at Athey Creek, um, you'll notice there's things we talk about over and over again. Oh, Pastor Brett, we already covered that. And I always say, good. I remember uh, as a young kid, I went to through the Bible teaching church and I remember having heard the stories before and I remember sort of having a little bit of an attitude, probably around junior high. I was like, I've already heard this story. Yeah, 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 I got this one down, whatever. Um, and then I started teaching Sunday school. And, and then I remembered, I had to kind of remember exactly how the story, you know, not just generally the story. I had to remember exactly how the story went and what it meant. And there's something about teaching the word that makes you remember the word better. I sometimes think that's why the Lord put me in this position, not because, wow, there's a guy I can use. No, it's like, ooh, what can we do to help Brett uh, figure out the Bible? Uh, let's make him a pastor. So he kind of has to remember. And, and, but that's part of the deal is, is repetition. The Romans made that up. They said repetition is the mother of all learning. The Romans made that. But I found that what a true thing that is. Um, uh, here's the question, how well do you know the Bible? And you might say, well, I know it really well. But my question might be better, uh, can you teach it to other people? Um, because once you start doing that, it just takes your uh, remembrance and your understanding of the word kind of to a whole nother level, which is really, really helpful and good. Um, and it's important that we teach the word to others. There's people that will never set foot in this church on a Wednesday night Bible study because our parking lots were not big enough. <laughs> uh, no, no. There's, there's some people that won't come to this church because they just, that's just something they would never do. 
And I, I wonder if maybe it's your job to say, I'm gonna take what I learned here, even in repetition, and continue to pass it on to others. Um, so the question is, how well can you teach others? Um, you know, when we talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel, can you explain that to people? Because that's, that's an amazing thing in the Bible that's really helpful. Uh, like I said earlier, can you defend the resurrection of Jesus and talk about it and know the details of it? First Peter chapter three, verse 15 and 16, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always, it says, to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, but that's true today, isn't it? People calling Christian, Christians evildoers, um, that they may be ashamed that, uh, that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. The word conversation is probably better translated lifestyle, a good lifestyle. And you're supposed to be ready, having an answer of the reason of the hope that we have in Christ. Um, that's something we're all called to do. And that's why I love going through the Bible, even though, like for example, the gospels, we're, we've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We've had the same stories several times, um, but that's great because repetition is the mother of learning. Get, get into the habit. If, if you wanna be wise, get into the habit. When you hear something again, instead of saying, oh yeah, I've heard this before, um, say, oh, I'm gonna dial in the story even that much more, having heard it again right now and let that repetition really drill it into our hearts that we might learn. Uh, very important. Well, back to this text here. Uh, it says there in verse 10, now this is a bummer. Remember I t I'm kind of talking about how great the women are and how goofy the men tend to be? Well, this even gets worse. Uh, this is so classic right here. Verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things to the apostles. That's exactly what the uh, angel told them to do. Remember in verse nine, go tell this to the rest of the guys. So they went, verse 11, and their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. Um, the, 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 the Greek word here for idle tales is leros, uh, which means uh, babbling of an insane mind. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything about that. Um, are you a husband or a man that when a woman talks, you kind of go, oh, that's just, well, I, I'm not gonna say babbling of an insane mind because none of you would think that. Uh, but I do think there's a thing where men do tend to tune ladies out. Now, by the way, I've caught my wife, Debbie, tuning me out sometimes too. So it can go both ways. I'm, you know, but men, <laughs> we tend to be the worst at that one, uh, quite frankly. Um, and here's the disciples going, yeah, these are just the ladies, idle talk, you know, babbling of an insane mind. Uh, you know, like they're just dismissing these women. Um, it's kind of sad, uh, you know, how the disciples are missing the most important truth that was gonna ever be declared throughout all human history, that Jesus rose from the grave. And these ladies are coming earnestly saying, you guys, he has risen. He's risen from the dead. Like, yeah, whatever. You guys have been drinking your bath water again. Like uh, the ladies, you know, these spiritual ladies being weirdos. Um, so sad that the disciples, it's gonna, it's gonna like take the Lord smacking them upside the head to say, come on, I really have risen from the grave. Um, Mary Magdalene, by the way, seems to be the one leading this charge, interestingly enough. Um, did you know that it's kind of interesting that St. Augustine referred to Mary Magdalene as the apostle to the apostles. And, um, and this is where you kind of see that maybe, where you know, the apostles were sitting there going, yeah, Jesus died. And then this one was sent by an angel uh, to go and talk to the disciples. Hey, he's risen. So verse 12, then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher. And stooping down, he beheld the linen cloths uh, laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Uh, he's like, I wonder what happened here. Uh, maybe the, you know, those ladies are sort of right. The tomb is empty and here's his grave clothes, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the word cloths or clothes, it's plural, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and um, when it says he beheld the linen clothes, it, you know, um, this is one of the main reasons, by the way, I don't believe the shroud of Turin is real. Uh, if you do, great, good for you. If you believe it's authentic, good for you. I don't believe it's real. Look, there's a couple reasons why. One of the reasons is the dis biblical description doesn't talk about one piece of cloth. It talks about several cloths is the idea. The plural here is kind of important. 
Um, but the Shroud of Turin, if you don't know what it is, of course, it's famous as being you know, the holy relic. Uh, they claim, you know, some people claim this is the cloth that covered Christ. Another reason I, I think that it's probably not true is because it looks more like the surfer from California, Jesus, <laughs> than maybe the real Jesus would have looked. Uh, if, you, if you know uh, his ethnicity and the place and the world and stuff like that, um, is this a, you know, sort of a forgery? Uh, that's the big debate. And if you've been watching, there's shows that show how it's authentic. There's shows that show how it's a forgery. And they've been going back and forth for decades on whether this Shroud of Turin is the one that, you know. Um, the reason why I really don't get into this is even if it is the cloth of Christ, I, I sort of resist this stuff. Um, and the reason why, it's the same reason why, you know, the king smashed the brass serpent with the pole that Moses had made. Because remember, they started to worship it. And if there's one thing the church is guilty of is worshiping these relics. Um, on our, Paul's missionary journeys to, you know, on our trip that we're taking this August with Athey Creekers, we got a sailing vessel, 170 Athey Creekers signed up. We're gonna go. And one of the places we're gonna end up going is Rome. Uh, and we're gonna go see St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, and uh, this is last time we were there, we shot some footage. And um, one of the things that's gonna be really shocking when we group, if you've never been there, is how, uh, you know, thou shalt not make into thee any graven image. And people are like worshiping a lot of these images and statues. And it just gets kind of really weird. There's dead popes you can go see and they're not, they're like in glass coffins. You can see their faces. And they're like, see, he looks as good as the day he died. It's like, no, you probably should cover it up. It's, you know, he's all wrinkly like a raisin. It doesn't look very good anymore. Uh, cover up. But if you go in here, it's, it's beautiful architecture and the artistry is amazing. Um, you know, it's just, it's an incredible place really. And it's worth seeing. Um, but it just kind of sickens you when you start seeing, like, you know, when they get to St. Peter's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a statue here. I'll show you here in a second. There's, you know, St. Peter and he's sitting on this, this statue. But if you look at, uh, we got a little video of what I've always talked about here. Um, see how smooth his, 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 right, his right foot is? People go and they line up to kiss his foot and they've been kissing it for centuries. For so long, they've been kissing it um, that he no longer has any toes. And they've kissed his toes clean off, toe-main poisoning. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's embarrassing. You couldn't get me to put my lips on that if you paid me a thousand dollars, man. That's so gross. Even if I had a handy wipe. Um, question. What do you think Peter would think about this? We kind of know because the disciples, when they saw people worshiping them, they did stuff like they ripped their clothes and said, we are not gods. We are men. Um, I think Peter would reject St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, just read your Bible. But because of tradition, uh, people have been kissing these toes clean off. Uh, by the way, uh, this, is, this is after they repaired it. Uh, did you know they repaired the toe? I don't know how they did it. Maybe some JB weld they put on there and you know, got it all back into toe business. Um, but they've since you know, kissed off the JB weld or whatever they used to, to uh, sort of bring it back. Um, but that's your reverent toward the Catholic Church. Um, I believe it's one of the biggest problems with the, along with some others. The Roman Catholic Church gets really kind of weird when it comes to these relics. Um, the Bible even you know talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Even the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it will save us. It will deliver us. Did it save them against the Philistines? No, the Philistines crushed them and stole the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and the Lord, I think, has a way of saying, you know what, I'm not into, you know, I, I will use these symbols like the brass serpent. I will use the symbol, the Ark of the Covenant. But once people start worshiping, um, we're already way off, way off from what God has for us. So when it comes to the Shroud of Turin, I put that in the same category. Question, will the Ark of the Covenant be found again? Brad, didn't you see Indiana Jones? He found it, like <laughs> it's, it's in the movie. It's in some warehouse somewhere. Um, no, that's just the movies. Uh, there's people, the, the, the uh, Coptic Christians down in Egypt say they have it. The Jews, some of the Jews say they have it deep under Jerusalem. But the reason I don't believe uh, we're, the Ark of the Covenant is ever gonna be found again is because in the millennial kingdom, um, the Ark of the Covenant will be remembered no more. They're gonna forget. It's just gonna not even be brought to remembrance anymore in the millennial kingdom. Why? Um, again, that's part of the shadow. We're gonna have Christ ruling in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. You don't need the Ark of the Covenant because you have Christ there. Well, watch out for relics, especially if you have a kind of a Catholic heritage in your family and you know, you've know you seen the head of John the Baptist. Well, which one, the one in Jerusalem or the one in Rome? Have you ever thought about that? 
one, one tour guide was, you know, asked, um, how can there be a head in Rome, but also a head of John the Baptist, you know, the skull of John the Baptist and the skull in Jerusalem. But the skull in Jerusalem is much smaller. And, and they say, because it's older, it's the real one. But the, tour, the quick thinking tour guide would ask, how is there two skulls? And he said, well, the one in Jerusalem is when John the Baptist was a child. And the one here <laughs> is the skull when he was an adult. So it gets loony, pretty loony, pretty fast. Well, verse 13 and behold, two of them went this, uh, that same day to a village called Emmaus. Uh, by the way, Emmaus means warm springs, which is kind of cool, um, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, about seven miles. And they walked, uh, pardon me, they talked together all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together, they reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Um, notice the, there's a bit of a, a graduation, a pro progression, I should say, of conversation. First, they're talking together. Then they're reasoning together, which is sort of a little higher level of conversation from just talking to reasoning. Um, and then um, notice what Jesus says here, verse 16, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And when he had said that unto him, what manner of communications are these that you have done, uh, that you have one to another as you walk and are sad. The, um, this interesting word, the what manner of communication is this? Um, the idea is maybe implied here in the Greek language, uh, a, um, a heated conversation. It went from, you know, just a discussion to sort of reasoning about what, what was going on with Jesus dying and being buried in a tomb. And now it's gotten to this sort of a conversation and Jesus just kind of shows up and he, uh, he says, hey, what, 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 you know, what manner of communications are these? Like, why are you guys all heat, heated up talking about something with intensity is sort of the idea. Um, have you ever noticed sometimes you think you're talking with someone, but you're actually yelling at them or, you know, talking at them? That's kind of the impression that I get when these guys are sort of arguing a little bit about what's going on. And Jesus is like, hey, what are you guys, what's the contention about? Um, well, Verse 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, what things? <laughs> I love that, what things? Um, now, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, here's where we sort of ask that question. Why do these people, after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, why do they not recognize Jesus? Big question. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to all those stories. John chapter 20 is kind of the first one, uh, verses 15 and 16, where remember Jesus saw Mary there and supposing him to be the gardener, she, she didn't recognize Jesus. Um, uh, you know, uh, she, so why did she not recognize? Well, you know, the people speculate, well, she's weeping. Jesus said, why are you weeping, woman? And maybe the tears in her eyes blurred her. Uh, maybe he was afar off. Maybe, you know, he was standing kind of further down in the garden. And, and it was also very early in the morning in darkness. So some people say maybe she just didn't recognize him um, because it was dark and she was weeping and it was, he was off gardening seemingly. And so she just assumed that he was the gardener. Uh, maybe that's it. Uh, another instance, remember the disciples were out fishing. John chapter 21, verse four. Uh, but when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. How could they not know it was Jesus? Again, the distance early in the morning, maybe they just didn't recognize him at first because he was so far away. But, but then it happens again here. Um, and you say, yeah, this one's face to face. I mean, these guys are walking and talking with Jesus. So you can't get over the tear thing or the distance. Why is Jesus not recognized here? Well, this, this one gives us the answer. Did you see it? It already told us the answer um, there uh, in verse 16. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Why did they not recognize Jesus? Because for some reason, Jesus wanted himself to be supernaturally veiled. And we know that for this case, kind of interesting. Um, could it be that Jesus did the same thing with Mary, the same thing with the disciples when they were fishing? Maybe, you know, you might say, well, Brett, why would Jesus want to supernaturally veil himself so that they wouldn't recognize him at first? Don't know. Um, I wonder, however, if, I mean, I'll, I'll just throw out some theory to you. Uh, maybe if, have you ever noticed that when somebody who's famous 
or exalted or well-known says something, people get all dizzy and they don't even really hear and they, don't, they, they, they kind of miss the point altogether. I wonder if Jesus would have said, you know, just showed up as Jesus. I wonder if they would have just freaked out and fallen down. But Jesus, especially with these two guys, he's gonna to explain to them something that's profound. Christ in the Old Testament, as we talked about on Sunday. I wonder if Jesus said, I want these guys to hear something. And if I show up as Jesus, they're not gonna hear a word I say because they'll be all, you're risen from the grave. But they won't hear what he has to say. I wonder, maybe Jesus just said, I've got work I need to do and I can't have the whole celebrity thing get in the way of the message that I wanna share with these guys. So he supernaturally veils the eyes of these two guys. Um, and we'll see when the Lord will take the veil off and suddenly they'll recognize him. Um, so this is a supernatural intervention of why these guys can't see who Jesus is. And I believe Jesus had good reason. I'm not sure that's the reason, the one that I gave you, but that's just offering one possible, uh, 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 possible thing. Uh, does anybody remember, when did they actually recognize Jesus in the story? Right, when he broke the bread at the table. Um, I wonder if the Lord said, oh, watch this. As he's breaking the bread, they're like, duh, whoa, duh, that's Jesus. We were walking with, now they're all dizzy and freaked out and celebrity and out, like, oh, Jesus is here, come But they still had a calmness enough before to hear the message that he shared, which is kind of important. Um, did he look, did he make himself look different? Uh, maybe slightly, maybe with the same, maybe with the scars. Some people argue that his face was scarred from the beating. Uh, maybe, you know, he just didn't look the same. There's all kinds of um, uh, reasons people, but I have no problem with just the Lord veiling his identity uh, before the, this, these people. It's okay to believe that, I think. Well, verse 19 goes on. It says, he said to them, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Interesting that they, they talked about Jesus as just a prophet. Um, verse 20, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have uh, crucified him. Uh, but we trusted that it had been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel or saved Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that he um, had also seen a vision of angels, which um, said he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. So they explained to Jesus what happened. He already knew. But Jesus says, verse 25, said to them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Jesus is just saying, all, you know, all these things have already been written. You should have kind of known. Now, when he says fools, this is a rough translation because we, we always say, if you call someone a fool, um, it's insulting. And there is a place in the Bible that says, if you call your brother a fool, you're, you're like, uh, that's, that's one of the sins of the Sermon on the Mount. You don't want to do that. You're guilty of like murder and stuff. So, but the word here is not fool as we would say. Um, uh, it's the Greek word ano etos, which means um, people of little understanding. He, he's saying, you guys that don't understand, that's what he's saying. Um, they're having a rough time understanding. He's not calling them idiots. He's having compassion on them and he's now gonna teach them the truth. And that's where it says in verse 27, at the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, uh, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village where they went and made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is toward the evening and the day is far spent. And he went into the tarry with them. It's like Jesus said, yeah, okay, nice seeing you guys. See you later. And the guy's like, what? Don't let him go. Come and stay with us. I, I love this. Uh, it makes me wonder what was Jesus doing? Was he messing with them? Like, yeah, it's nice talking with you guys. We'll see you later. And they're like, please stay with us. You, you just told us stuff that's really important. He's like, okay, you got food, I'll come. <laughs> and it came to pass, verse 30, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. And verse 31, their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. La, 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 la. That's amazing. Like they're kind of like, oh, great. We just realized he's Jesus and now he's gone. Um, 
But what a confirmation of the time they had spent. And what did they think after that? Well, the Bible tells us, verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Man, we talked about good heartburn last weekend and that's what this whole section was about. Well, verse 33, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed and he hath appeared to Simon. Um, and they, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. So they kind of explain all this stuff. Now, um, there was this time, it seems that Jesus showed up to Peter uh, specifically. We don't know for sure when that was, by the way. When Jesus just shows up to Peter, it seems like by himself. There's a hint in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses four through six. It says, and at that, um, he was buried and he rose again on the third day, according to the scripture, and that he was seen of Cephas. That's another word probably for Peter. And then of the 12. And after that, he was seen above the 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep or some are dead now. So when Paul was making this argument of the resurrected Jesus, more than 500 people saw Jesus in his resurrected form. If you have 500 eyewitness accounts of a resurrected Jesus, that's pretty good. If you have a court case and you have two witnesses, man, you got an airtight case. But if you've got a court case with 500 witnesses, um, that's, that's what we have with Jesus. Pretty amazing. Um, but I love it, verse 35. He was clearly seen there when he was uh, breaking the bread. How can you see Jesus the clearest? At the table of communion. I think that's where we see it. Breaking bread, remembering the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. Something we should do often. Verse 36. And as they had thus spoke, uh, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. By the way, this is a key passage because there's some of, some of the heresies and preachings and teachings of weird groups of past that when Jesus rose, he was, not, he was simply a spirit and he wasn't really a body. This, this does that in. These people touched him and he says, I'm flesh and blood, blood just like you guys, bones. Um, and he ate food, you know. So, uh, so I, I remember reading, I think it was the Gnostics that sort of believed that Jesus would put food up to his mouth after he rose, but he never really put it in. He would just kind of hold it up and then put it down. That's not the Jesus I know. Uh, Jesus seemed to like food. And even here, he's like, oh, you got some food? Let's eat. Um, I think Jesus was just as much physical body in this part of the story as he was in the other. Well, verse 41, and while they yet believed, um, uh, not for joy and wondered, um, he said to them, have ye here any meat? Oh, he's hungry again. Love it. <laughs> and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of honeycomb. So honey glazed salmon sounds pretty good to me. I mean, if you have to eat fish, that's the way to eat it. Um, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand all the scriptures. Oh, that's my prayer. Verse 45, Lord, open to us, as we read through the Bible, open to us our understanding of all the scriptures. Oh, pretty awesome. Verse 46, and he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Here in verse, um, you know, verse 46 and 47, it's such a key. What are we supposed to be preaching? Um, I think it's so important to remember to preach both repentance, verse 47, and remission of sins. I've noticed some people are more about repentance and they preach kind of the fire and brimstone, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And other people say, yeah, forget that. Uh, you're saved by grace through faith. So we're just gonna talk about forgiveness. Um, the problem is you need to teach both things. The two things should be taught. You gotta teach repentance of sins. Jesus said that right here. 
but you also need to teach about remission. If you only go to one, you might miss uh, the main part of the gospel. You gotta have both, that's both. That's a little bit my problem with he gets us campaign. Um, they left out the repentance part. That just, he gets you the way you are. Just be like the way, you can be gay, you can be on your way to get an abortion, you can be doing all these sinful stuff, uh, but he gets us. And they just leave it there. Um, but there is, there's an important point, you, you need to repent from your sins. So repentance and remission of sins, we, we wanna teach both in balance, uh, very, very important. Verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in Jeru the city of Jerusalem, and until you be endued with the power from on high. The Greek word for power, anybody remember what that is? Dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. This is where Jesus says, go wait in, in Jerusalem and uh, I'm gonna give you power, which is the Holy Spirit. We're gonna read about that in Acts chapter one. <laughs> well, there in verse 50, and uh, he led them out as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Does that remind you of anything? Does anybody remember else, who else in the Bible would go out in front of everybody and lift up their hands and bless the people? The high priest. Read Leviticus chapter nine, verse 22. That's one of the times where he'd lift out and bless the people. I, I kind of see this beautiful picture here. Verse 51, and it came to pass while he blessed them, he uh, was parted from them and carried up into heaven. This is his ascension. Um, and verse 52, they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Um, after Jesus rose from the grave and then ascended in heaven, what, what did the church do? Well, we come to the last verse, verse 53. The church, what did they do? They went to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God, amen. Man, I love that. And there it is, the end of our Through the Bible study, lap number two. Yes. That's great. <laughs> Yes. Well, Lord, we are so thankful. Uh, we're so thankful. We, we too, we applaud you and your, your holy word and make us like this early church, Lord, that, that was uh, praising your name continually and giving glory to God for all the things of your word, Lord. And I, I pray that Athe Creek would be not just into studying your word, but be worshipers in spirit and in truth, Lord. Um, how, how thankful we are for your word. We're excited to pick it up in John and just keep going again, Lord. And I pray you just continue to reveal yourself to us that we might know you better. Bless these, your people who've taken time to do this study. We pray your blessing in Jesus' name, amen.